um, telling the history of this magnificent engineering achievement. So everyone, please welcome Christian Walmart, who is going to talk about it. Thank you very much. Um, my task in the next 40 minutes is quite simple, actually. I'm going to uh, try to persuade you that, uh, first of all, that this is uh, the greatest engineering achievement ever. Uh, and secondly, I'm going to try to persuade you that uh, you should go on this railway. Um, uh, because it is actually the most uh, wonderful, fascinating, if sometimes slightly dull uh, experience, but that's all part of it. So, uh, first of all, let me try and tell you what the Trans-Siberian is about. Now, uh, if you think that uh, in the left-hand corner there uh, uh, is Moscow, uh, and uh, my little thing doesn't work, it don't, oh, it's not working. Um, it, it, and in the blue corner there is Moscow, and on the right uh, is Vladivostok, uh, and there is uh, 6,000 miles uh, uh, in between. Now, 6,000 miles takes us from here to, say, San Francisco or beyond uh, Mumbai. And that is all uh, one railway built uh, in the, largely in the 1890s, uh, early 1900s, by a, uh, in a country that was an absolute monarchy uh, that was pretty impoverished, that had very little uh, industrialization, uh, and yet managed to uh, build this railway across uh, the most fantastic, uh, most difficult uh, countryside. Now, I've written uh, half a dozen uh, books about uh, uh, railways. Uh, I've written about the London Underground, I've written about uh, Britain's Railways and so on. You can see all those books, I'm sure, they're in the tent. Um, uh, and one characteristic of all these stories is that they're always heroes. There's always heroes who, uh, without whom the project would not have happened. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, oddly enough, uh, the hero was the equivalent of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, was a sort of finance minister, a guy called Sergei Vitter who uh, drove the project through, seeing it as uh, a way of bringing together Russia um, and, uh, and is cementing uh, uh, the control of uh, Moscow or St. Petersburg uh, over uh, this vast territory that I just uh, uh, kind of showed you. And um, to do so, he had to persuade the Tsar. The Tsar was uh, Alexander, although he died during it and it was taken over by, by Nicholas, uh, who was the Tsar of it, who actually uh, was, of course, the last Tsar. Um, and despite the fact he was a rather dull fellow who was slightly kind of uninspiring, did actually uh, see the project through. And uh, again, so it was a kind of combination of this absolute monarch who was eventually sold on the idea, initially Alexander, then his son, uh, and the brilliance of uh, Sergei Vitter, who managed to kind of play the Russian bureaucracy uh, and ensure that uh, the project was, uh, was seen, uh, seen through. And then, of course, there were a whole series of engineers. When, when I travelled on the line uh, back in uh, November 2012, uh, there were little museums along the place, and, uh, uh, and each of them would have these wonderful kind of uh, displays of uh, the engineers who built the line, people whose names are long forgotten, but who, uh, 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 you know, were contributed to this achievement. And, and I just think you have to, just, just to take a little step back, you have to think, you know, what were they doing? What were they doing? They were building this railway of about 6,000 miles, 5,750 miles, uh, through you know, territory that was very uninhabited, largely uninhabited, that uh, had you know, lots of trees, but they were the wrong sort of trees. So they couldn't even make the sleepers out of these trees. They had to kind of import, uh, import the, the, the different types of trees to make the, the sleepers out of. 
um, where they either had to cut down forests or they had to lay tracks across um, uh, lay tracks across kind of you know territory that was incredibly difficult. Uh, um, you know where they had to put embankments down uh, with very little mechanisation, um, with uh, using labour that. Uh, was largely fairly reluctant uh, to, to, you know, they had to kind of pay kind of uh, uh, people quite a lot. It was not slave labor. That's an important thing, you know, that slavery had been, uh, serfdom had been abolished. Uh, so they had to induce people to come to uh, Siberia to build the railway. All sorts of uh, foreign people uh, uh, joined. Actually, there were Italians, there were Persians, there were uh, all sorts of uh, different kind of uh, uh, nationalities involved. Um, uh, you know, with you know, pretty basic uh, methods laying uh, 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 this railway, you know, with you know, hardly any kind of uh, equipment that we would call, uh, uh, that we could conceivably call, call modern. They had a little, uh, the odd kind of bit of steam-powered uh, 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 drills and excavators and the like. But largely, it was done by hand. So, so whereas in Britain at the time we were building railways that uh, were built with the help of uh, you know large amounts of uh, engineering equipment, they were really still in an age of the railways of kind of 30 or 40 years uh, uh, previous to, to, to that, and and so. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, they, they basically used large amounts of, of labour and very little else. Did they work in the winter? Well, they, they worked to some extent in the winter, kind of making embankments and the like, but they couldn't really uh, uh, do very much. Uh, they could work in tunnels, but actually there were no tunnels for about this first two and a half, three thousand miles because they avoided tunnels. They, they built a basic, crude, single track railway which is completely different, as you'll see in a minute, from what it is uh, today. Uh, and they followed the contour lines of the hills, uh, and in winter they had kind of uh, uh, basically uh, small teams still doing the odd bit of, bit of, bit of work. So essentially it had about five months uh, a year. They started uh, in 1891, um, when, uh, after many false starts, uh, and uh, it was largely completed by, by 1901. So, you know, 10 years to build this uh, 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 fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, railway. And as I say, there were very few tunnels, uh, and what tunnels they were, were built again with uh, uh, amazingly kind of crude, uh, uh, crude methods. And things went wrong. <laughs> um, I'm slightly unclear as to what's happening in this picture, but all I can say is that it wasn't intended to be thus. Um, and uh, uh, they obviously had some repair work uh, to, to do afterwards. Um, and by and large, you know, by and large, it proceeded uh, quite smoothly. By and large, they, they didn't actually kill that many people building it. They killed rather more than would be acceptable today, probably something like 0.5%. But compared with uh, railway schemes, even the Carlisle to Settle Railway, which was being built kind of about 15 uh, years before this, uh, which was our last major, ma major uh, railway in difficult conditions, um, the death rate was not that high. The, the really bad job was working on bridges, uh, because uh, people often just simply just got so cold they just fell off. Uh, and 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 uh, uh, died. There was actually nothing nothing you could do. But but uh, by and large, they looked after their workforces. They uh, they worked twelve hour days, uh, but they had a big lunch in the middle. Uh, amazingly enough, they were reasonably well fed, and all that was because uh, uh, you know they had to, uh, as I said, induce people to, to to come and work on this railway. It was not. Uh, you know, it was not kind of uh, 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 forced labour, except at the western end of it. They, they divided really essentially the railway into three sections, and at the, uh, sorry, at the eastern end of it, uh, they eventually got uh, uh, convicts to, to help uh, build uh, uh, some, of the, some of the railway because uh, they could find no other labour. And the convicts had a great incentive, because uh, the convicts were allowed... Uh, uh, basically, 
uh, the amount of time they worked on the railway off their sentence again. So they would double. Uh, so if they worked a year on the railway, they got two years that year off, and then another year off uh, their sentence. So there was a great incentive uh, to actually uh, uh, to actually work on the railway. And they used a lot of modern engineering methods uh, um, with all kinds of uh, different designs of, of bridges and, and uh, uh, other parts of the railway. And they, they used quite a lot, of, interesting enough, of American engineering techniques. Uh, you know, large numbers of the uh, engineers, the, the Russian engineers, went to America and uh, essentially stole <laughs> or borrowed uh, the ideas of how to build bridges and uh, uh, brought them back uh, 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 to, to Russia. Um, and the bridges were the last bits to be built. So in the, uh, in the early days, uh, people would take trains to maybe uh, uh, the, the border of the Ob River or, uh, or, or, or uh, the Volga or whatever, and then take some sort of uh, conveyance across. And in the uh, winter, sometimes they would actually lay tracks temporarily across these rivers uh, and get everybody out because they didn't quite trust that uh, the river. And the people would walk across. There's some great descriptions. Uh, uh, in my book, actually, um, there's some great descriptions of uh, uh, how the early travellers kind of had to contend with sometimes kind of walking uh, uh, next to the, 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 the railway line on kind of ice to get across a river while the train kind of went gingerly across the, 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 the ice and, and so on. But uh, so the, 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 the rivers were actually, uh, uh, the, 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 the bridges were actually built uh, right at the end. Uh, my little red thing doesn't work. Um, uh, irritating enough. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, the Russians did something rather naughty. Um, now, what you don't really want to do uh, if you want to keep at peace with your neighbours is to uh, build a uh, railway through uh, another country. Um, and the Russians did that. So uh, if you look at the, the, the lower line, which goes through Harbin, uh, the CER, the Chinese Eastern Railway, uh, they realized that uh, they would kind of manage to uh, um, uh, save about a thousand miles if they went through Manchuria. And Manchuria is part of China, which was very weak at the time, and uh, they took advantage of a treaty they had signed with uh, China earlier on, a few years before that, to build a railway, the, the Chinese Eastern Railway, rather than going on the Northern Route, which was not actually completed until uh, 1916, um, uh, much later. And uh, this caused no end of conflict. Uh, um, because uh, uh, the, the Japanese did not like the idea of, um, of, of a railway being built, and we'll see in a minute that it provoked war. This is part of the China Eastern Railway, which is probably the most expensive uh, uh, part of uh, the line to have been built, and uh, was uh, you know, cut through kind of uh, some mountain ranges, uh, very difficult conditions. There were lots of bandits uh, ready to kind of kill the, the engineers and so on, uh, and the hostility of some of the uh, local people. And they actually created the town of Harbin, uh, which uh, now is a huge kind of Chinese town, but then was uh, basically the headquarters of this railway, which was essentially a colonial imposition by Russia on China as part of uh, its motive of building the railway. So let's think, why did they build this railway? What was it all about? Um, you know, were they trying to uh, you know, unite Russia, which was the kind of ostensible reason, and, and link in with this vast region? Did they have imperialist ambitions over uh, the Far East? Certainly. And, and my view is that actually, uh, while presenting this as a kind of national project and, and something to, to, uh, uh, to unite Russia, the main reason was probably, uh, or, uh, arguably, uh, imperious. There's the idea of establishing themselves over this uh, vast swathe of Siberia and over the, the Far East itself. So, um, 
they had they had some technical difficulties. This is Lake uh, Baikal, which, uh, um, as you see from uh, here, is a lake uh, on the on the left there, uh, 300 miles uh, uh, from end to end, about 30, 40 miles across. And as you can see, the the the, the bend there from Irkutsk. Uh, uh, southwards uh, was quite a detour and the most difficult part of the railway to build. So uh, they actually uh, um, couldn't get through initially, and so they bought. Now this is the only British involvement actually. They bought a couple of uh, uh, of icebreakers from Britain, which were assembled uh, by uh, by the Russians in, in near the lake, uh, and in the uh, winter. Uh, Baikal is the most amazing lake in the world. It's the deepest lake in the world. It has one seventh of all the fresh water in the world. Great statistic. And uh, it, uh, uh, it, it, it freezes over in a, in a quite bizarre way in about January. I was there in November, so it wasn't quite frozen yet. Um, and it's very, it's very chunky ice. It's not like a kind of nice smooth kind of bit. It's very chunky ice. And, so for a while they managed to keep uh, uh, to keep the, the kind of uh, uh, passageway open. The trains would actually go on these uh, 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 on the on the ships uh, uh, behind, as I said, built by the British. Uh, but then, when it really freezes over, uh, they would then uh, uh, actually try to lay tracks across. Um, now, the Japanese uh, did not like the idea of the Trans-Siberian Railway. So, not surprisingly, uh, they took advantage of the fact that the railway was still not complete by 1904. Uh, it still involved this sort of transfer uh, across. Initially, they tried to, uh, when they laid the tracks on the lake, they tried to uh, drive a, a whole train with the locomotive. Uh, and the first locomotive that did that is still at the bottom of the lake. Um, so they decided that they couldn't quite do that, and so they had this uh, uh, way of transporting kind of uh, the wagons across, largely pulled by horses. They had two uh, tea huts in the middle to, uh, to, for the men to, uh, uh, to kind of get refreshments. Now, given that it's minus 20, is not uncommon there. It was not, not a great kind of job. And of course, it, it, militarily, it was a great blockage. So the Japanese realized this and uh, invaded uh, part of Manchuria, took over uh, a, a port, uh, and then worked their way up, kind of trying to kind of uh, stop the Russians from uh, basically taking over in the Far East. And they had a, a short and very uh, bloody war. This is, this is the, uh, the, the, the part of the Baikal uh, railway which they which underneath the lake, which they then built very quickly to try to uh, ensure that they could send the troops directly through to uh, uh, Siberia, but it still t took about 25 days to travel on the on the on the railway. It was a very primitive railway at that time. Uh, it is the most prettiest part of the railway. Unfortunately, the railway does not run by there anymore. Um, and uh, and so the the. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the basically the, 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 the Japanese uh, were able to uh, win the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, they, which then prompted something of a, a revolution uh, in uh, in Russia, the 1905 revolution. So um, you know uh, the railway not only managed to provoke a war, which is I think the only war that I've managed to discover that was prompted entirely by a railway. But it also almost kind of prompted the end of the Tsarist regime. And my contention, which I'll sum up at the end, is that actually this railway was responsible both for the end of Tsarism and the end of communism. It's a rather grand notion, but I write about railways, so they are the most important thing as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> anyway, so they built a whole vernacular, of, having finished this railway, they built a whole, there was a whole vernacular of the railway. Uh, they built stations. They built towns. They built four different classes of stations. They were kind of standard buildings. So this was uh, the first class, and this was the second class. Interesting enough, when we visited uh, the railway and went to a railway museum near Novosibirsk, the little local suburban station looks exactly like that today. Um, so you know, if you go along there, you can still see kind of uh, remnants of the original railway. And this is kind of third class station. Uh, 
and this is the fourth class station. So I was kind of really well regimented, and this is the fifth class station. Right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is just a little halt where they kind of, they actually define it in terms of, uh, uh, um, you know, how many people were going to use it and, and, and so on. So, um, you know, it was, it, again, you know, they, they, it is difficult to separate the whole idea and region of Siberia from the railway. And the railway, uh, it, it created the Siberia of, of today. The two are completely inseparable uh, uh, in, in terms of history, in terms of culture, in terms of everything else. And of course, they had to get people to work on this railway. Um, and again, they sometimes employed some of the convicts, and uh, you know, which is rather odd that you know they kind of employed thieves and whatever to then handle the baggage that you know then was kind of uh, uh, you know quite quite affluent people would then be uh, 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 transporting a, across with them. Uh, so I mean, it was not uh, you know it was not easy recruiting kind of uh, people to go and work in kind of lonely signal boxes in the middle of, of, of Siberia. Um, and it was a bit of a ramshackle railway at the beginning. You know, 1901, uh, there was something like uh, 80 crashes on the, on, on the railway, uh, mainly derailments and so on. And you have to think of this railway as almost a continuous enterprise, a, a, a sort of absolute continuous uh, investment uh, in improving uh, uh, the railway because uh, 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 you know, it, it was built as a fairly basic railway, uh, which then got uh, improved all the time. And they did get over these, uh, uh, these initial uh, crashes. It is of today a kind of enormous, uh, very safe, uh, uh, major artery of, uh, of, uh, of, of um, a part of, part of Russia. Um, and the other thing they tried to do uh, was to sell the railway to... Uh, if, if you think about it, it was a much better way of getting to, because it linked in with China, uh, it was a much better way of uh, getting, getting, to, uh, uh, getting to the Far East uh, than, uh, than uh, uh, taking a boat. So uh, they realised this and started kind of uh, building luxury uh, uh, coaches for, for people to travel on. And the, the great innovation was at the uh, Paris exhibition of 1900, where they uh, brought in a whole carriage, um, and uh, unfortunately I don't have a picture of it, but what they did was, you'd sit in this carriage uh, and have dinner, and they would have a, a series of kind of moving uh, images along, and, and the, the first one would just be a sort of bit of grass and stuff and would kind of go quite slowly, and then the, the, the ones further, they had a set of four or five of these um, on kind of conveyors, which, which would last, the whole show last about 15 minutes, and they would then kind of, the ones further away would show the towns that you were going past and, and so on. So you sat in this uh, dining car and had the experience of being on the railway. And amazing enough, these things have been rescued and are in the Hermitage uh, Museum in, in St. Petersburg now, which unfortunately, when I went to St. Petersburg, I didn't know that, so I didn't get to see them. But anyway, so that was, you know, they sold the, the railway to the kind of uh, uh, upper classes uh, as, you know, a comfortable experience of, of travelling. Now, it wasn't always like that. Some, again, some of the descriptions in my book show uh, that... Uh, uh, you know, some of the people expecting first class got rather third class kind of travel. Uh, you know, the coaches weren't available and so on. But lots of people had quite good experiences kind of travelling uh, on this railway. And it was an incredibly busy railway right from the beginning. It was full of uh, both freight traffic and it was full of uh, local uh, passenger traffic and it was full of these sort of uh, uh, affluent travellers going through to uh, 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 going through to China, um, and it resulted in uh, the settlement. This is a contemporary picture of 1910, which is done with by a guy called Chapin, who's uh, with some colour technique that uh, was actually uh, original, an amazing kind of uh, a photo, a series of photographs. Um, and uh, uh, essentially doubled the population of Siberia within the first 10 years. You know, it, they, they encouraged settlers. It wasn't quite like the American 
uh, transcontinental railway where um, it was it was uh, you know the, the main aim of the railway was settlement, but certainly it was part of an important part of it, and they gave a lot of incentives. Uh, for the settlers to, to, to come along very, they gave the, the head of the household a cheap ride on it who would then kind of, kind of find some sort of uh, uh, place to go and settle and then they would go back and get, get and bring their families and so on. So, so it was, you know, it was part of the, the whole idea of, uh, uh, of, of uh, settling Siberia and these towns built up uh, around the railway. Even today, uh, Within about 100 kilometres of the railway, either side, uh, there is virtually all the settlement. You know, there is very little kind of uh, uh, further out. Um, you know, and they built these towns. They created these towns out of out of virtually uh, nothing. And they provided all sorts of services. So they, the, the government built schools. I mean, a lot of money. The cost of the railway, which is almost impossible to determine, because the opaqueness of uh, Russian accounts and corruption and the like, and also the fact that they threw in a lot of cost of the railway into the services they provided. So they, they built churches, they built schools, and where there wasn't a church, they would have a, a church car who would come along maybe once a month and, uh, and people would, would uh, uh, pray in it. Um, you know, on the, on on the railway. So it was it was a it was a uh, you know literally uh, creating uh, the whole kind of uh, 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 kind of life of of, uh, of Siberia. And this is just a little aside. Here. This is the most bizarre use of the railway. There was a span uh, an Italian count who was uh, the Peking uh, Paris uh, road race in which there were only actually four contestants and most of them dropped out. Um, and uh, he won because he, he uh, contacted the local governor of uh, Siberia and said, can I drive my car along the railway when it's quiet? And so for about kind of uh, 200 miles, he drove along the, 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 the railway, kind of having made sure there weren't any trains coming in the other direction, uh, and found it kind of a much better experience than driving on the... Uh, on the roads of the time. There still, there still isn't actually a proper road between Vladivostok and, uh, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the railway. And this is the last bit of the railway to be built, the Usuri Railway, which is the, the, the northern bit above the uh, Chinese uh, Eastern Railway, where they finally uh, decided to uh, uh, bypass China, having caused this war with Japan. Uh, and so for the first time in 1916, there was actually a railway that ran all the way to uh, Vladivostok uh, via, the, uh, via the lake, uh, via Harabosk, which is uh, on the right there, uh, where there was a, a, a mile and a half long bridge over the, over the and through to, to Vladivostok, which as you can see from that is virtually the, the pink bit is Korea actually, so it's, it's right on uh, uh, the border uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, with uh, uh, Korea. So uh, uh, it wasn't until 1916, in fact, that the line was completed. And then, almost as soon as it completed, we then have a war along the railway. Uh, my book is actually full of tales of war and battles and starvation and, you know, all those kind of fun things you kind of uh, get. Uh, and uh, they had a war along the railway, which uh, was the Russian Civil War. Uh, and amazingly enough, the only time the Americans actually uh, sent troops to, to Russia. Uh, because the, the, the railway was taken over for a brief period of time by the Czech Legion. Uh, a, a long story which I don't have time to go into at the moment, but basically there were 40,000 Czech prisoners who, who took over the, the railway. It's a great pub quiz competition. You know, if you ever want setting a pub quiz, ask which, which nation took over the Trans-Siberian Railway. Nobody would ever be able to answer the fact that the Czechs took it over. Um, and basically the, the Civil War was fought with lots of armoured trains uh, and uh, 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 you know, was was the source of of uh, of, of uh, uh, you know, terrible battles and uh, uh, scenes of, of uh, refugees fleeing in in uh, in 1916 uh, in 1918, uh, and essentially, uh, um, dear old uh, 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 Trotsky. This is Strelnikov in Dr. Jivago, who of course is uh, Trotsky, who was running the, uh, running the uh, war from uh, his armored train uh, when he wasn't chasing Lara. 
Um, and there is Trotsky himself on the left, uh, uh, who was at the head of the, uh, of the army by then. Um, and so the, the, the communists took it over eventually, and they, used, uh, they had these wonderful propaganda trains, which uh, uh, was, uh, 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 was a way of trying to kind of convey to, to uh, the peasants the wonders of, of communism and the like. Um, and uh, they, would, they would have uh, uh, cinemas in there, they would, they would uh, come fully equipped with kind of wonderful films about you know, the great communist agriculture and new agriculture equipment, which of course they never got, but you know, they kind of uh, uh, portrayed it like that. So that was another uh, kind of another use of the railway. Um, after the war, it was in a great, terrible state, but Stalin loved the Trans-Siberian and poured vast amounts of money into repairing it uh, and bring it uh, back into use, possibly with the notion that he knew that it'd be very useful to send people to the gulags eventually, but I'm not sure whether that was his motive. But anyway, that's what it was used for uh, at some stage. And, uh, and he, he, he uh, created large swathes of industry along the railway, which then kind of made it even more uh, uh, essential to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 to ensure that it was in a, in a good condition. And uh, it started being electrified as early as the 1920s. Uh, it was by then largely double-tracked uh, um, and, and became completely double-tracked by about the 1950s. So it was you know, seen as a more and more important part of, uh, uh, of Russian uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, and uh, <coughs> Stalin also built some fantastic stations. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is Novosibirsk, which was a town which was created entirely by the by the railway. Actually, it was a village of you know a couple of hundred people uh, before it, and then it became you know it's now a kind of city of about 1.5 million, and and uh, uh, it has this fantastic station, this uh, this lovely kind of Siberian uh, uh, blue colour, which is which is kind of everywhere in Siberia. Um, and as I said, he used it uh, to eventually send people to the to the gulags, um, and uh, um, and you know uh, uh, caused uh, you know more more suffering. I mean, this railway this railway is responsible for an awful lot of downsides as well as uh, kind of amazing achievements. Um, and uh, you know, he, he kind of used it for military purposes uh, by the Second World War. That the, the railway became the kind of haven for industry. So industry was actually moved from uh, uh, Western Russia, which was under threat from the, the Germans, and moved kind of uh, along the, uh, the Trans-Siberian, which, which uh, meant actually it managed to continue to, uh, uh, to, to function. So, so again, that was a, a really uh, a kind of unexpected but important part of, of uh, uh, the use of it. And then the maddest idea of all, and, and I was discussing this with Oliver before, I mean, this is the most crazy kind of part of it. I mean, the Trans-Siberian itself was a fairly insane idea, absorbing a vast amount of uh, resources that, you know, if a, a cleverer monarch might have thought, well, uh, um, you know, we need to spend some money on, uh, instead on... Uh, trying to better the lot of our rather disaffected citizens. No, instead they used uh, it to build a railway. And then Stalin decided that he wanted to build a railway from uh, uh, that dotted line, uh, which is called the BAM, the Baikal Amur Railway, which, as you can see, goes to the north of the lake. It through land that really has nothing very much at all, uh, through to uh, the... The, 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 the Pacific Ocean uh, kind of north. And eventually it was intended to go to that. You can see the island off the coast there, the Sakhalin Islands. Eventually it was supposed to be in you know, a tunnel through to those, again, rather deserted uh, islands. And, I mean, this was, this was a, a, a project too far. And initially it was people in the gulags who were, who were building it. Uh, and in the war it was stopped. Um, and then Russian, uh, uh, sorry, Japanese... Uh, and German prisoners of war were sent out there to try and build it. And both these workforces largely perished in the attempt to build this uh, uh, railway line, which was started in uh, the 1930s and was not completed until the 1990s. And then they hit upon this idea of 
uh, getting uh, uh, Lenin's you, uh, uh, the Lenin Youth Brigade's uh, Komsomol kind of uh, uh, to build it. So they had the idea of you know this was the inspiring way of getting young people to young pioneers uh, to go and build this railway. Um, and it, they they did offer them inducements of giving them cars and flats after their kind of two or three year kind of service on the railway. And it was a cause of great disillusion because this was a mad enterprise. They were building it through permafrost. And the only trouble with permafrost is that it's not really permanent. That once you start kind of digging into the permafrost, you're affecting uh, kind of millennia old uh, ice, uh, which uh, was... Uh, <laughs> which was established at a period of time which when it was much colder than it is now. So once you disturb it, it doesn't actually, although it's cold inside the area, it's not as cold as it was when the ice was originally formed. And so it then never kind of quite refreezes in the same way and then causes untold difficulties. And these poor young pioneers who went with all the kind of inspiration of being wonderful communists and stuff found that this was a mad project that was absorbing vast amounts of money and wasn't actually uh, 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 working properly. It was both uh, men and women who were kind of attracted into building it, and as you can see, it was a it was a, a kind of uh, railway through uh, really very difficult uh, conditions, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't actually finished uh, until Putin came to power. Uh, the last bit kind of being uh, this tunnel, which again took about 40 years to build, and the the, the railway the, the old railway was above it. Uh, and, and they finally opened it in uh, uh, 1993, and, and uh, uh, it had taken 60 years. And you know, uh, my view is that it certainly contributed to the la to the uh, demise of communism. Uh, so, uh, uh, and they built some fantastic stations, but as you can see, there was nobody much in them. Um, We'll just finish off with two or three pictures that I took when I was there, and then I'll, I'll sum up. This is Gary Powers. Um, some of you might remember who Gary Powers is. He was the U-2 pilot who uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, got shot down uh, on a spying mission. And this is a, a photograph I took in Novosibir Station, uh, where they're still kind of proud of the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, they, they managed to down their jet. This is kind of Siberia, a fantastic kind of blue colours, this is uh, sort of showing that it's a, a modern railway. This is the dining car, that don't go to the dining cars if you go on this railway, right? The lady in the back there was picking her toenails when they arrived, and they charged us 10 pounds for a very poor breakfast and didn't really want us to be there. Uh, they were much busier kind of uh, looking after themselves. Uh, that's the soup, um, which is not fantastically appetising. Um, and this picture was photographed in the mail on Sunday when I wrote a uh, uh, kind of piece, and they rang me up and said, uh, were you really driving a locomotive? And I had to explain that actually there are no more steam locomotives on it, and I was in a museum, but there we are. <laughs> um, uh, and this is me and my wife, and uh, uh, the sleeping car tender, 9,288 kilometers. It's a little bit less than that now, because they've straightened out some curves. Uh, and, and my clicker has stopped working. Uh, and this is a Vladivostok station as opened by uh, Sarovich, Nicholas, and still looking much, pretty much uh, the same. This is Ulan Ude Station at 8 o'clock in the morning. The wonderful thing about this train is that although there's no more steam engine, it actually smells of coal the whole time because the, the heating is actually done uh, with coal, and, uh, which is what that smoke is coming through. So you, you, for those of you who are train spotters, you can imagine that actually it's a steam engine kind of uh, taking you all the way through. And this is, uh, uh, this is Zero, this is uh, Yaroslav Station in, in, in Moscow, uh, where all the, station, where all the uh, uh, trains arrive. So my contention is, I mean, not only was this the, the kind of greatest engineering feat, uh, but actually, if you look at the history, it contributed to a war uh, with Japan in 1904-05, which then kind of resulted in the pre-revolution 1905, which was actually uh, uh, defeated, but certainly set the kind of tone for the, the, the eventual 1917 revolutions. Um, and uh, you know, then it was it played an absolute vital part. Uh, first of all, in the Russian Civil War, where uh, 
uh, it eventually enabled uh, uh, the communists to establish themselves over the whole of Siberia. Then it played a vital part in the Second World War uh, when it enabled industry to be kind of uh, hidden away, uh, away from, from uh, the, the, the German advances and uh, definitely uh, contributed towards that. And then the building of the Baikal Amur uh, mainline had a, an amazingly uh, negative effect on uh, uh, on, on the, the notion that communism was kind of the way to go. It was Brezhnev's project, um, and uh, he tried to use it to rally these young pioneers, realizing that the kind of communist ethic, which always promised a good tomorrow, but never quite delivered it. And so the idea was that you know, this railway would uh, you know, bring about this state of nirvana that there was kind of chasing. And in fact, disillusioned hundreds of thousands of these young pioneers who then went back home expecting flats and cars which they then never got because there were too many of them to get all the flats and cars and uh, actually they held protest marches uh, uh, and the like and I my view is that certainly it, it, it contributed towards the demise of the communist ideal so that's quite an achievement for one railway, not just an engineering achievement, but a fantastic kind of series of political achievements. We might argue with some of the detail, but uh, as I say, I write about railways, and my role is really to talk about what the railways have done for us. And so this is what the railway, the Trans-Siberian, has done for Russia and world history. Thank you very much. there might be a contender for even madder engineering achievement, which is that this new idea of a railway to America. As we saw on the map, they have, they have the inching north from the band to Yakutsk, from whence they're planning to go to Magadan, from thence to Chukotka, and then supposedly build a tunnel under the Bering Strait, and so on. I mean, do you think this is going to happen? Do you think we could yet be saying that the, that the band is just a, a way station no, to I'm, I'm an old fellow, and it's certainly not going to happen in my lifetime. And you're a young fellow, and it's not going to happen in your lifetime either, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, look, the, the, the notion, I mean, first of all, there's these technical problems, that the further north you go, you're building on permafrost, which is, even though they have, the Chinese did manage to build their railway to Tibet, it, it causes enormous permanent expense. You know, every, every train that goes to Tibet has to have a doctor on it, you know, to, to kind of uh, 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 deal with the, with, with the, the, the problems. Uh, you know, building railways that far north is, is, is really difficult. Building a railway underneath uh, the Bering Strait is just unfathomable, literally unfathomable, <laughs> kind of the right word. Um, you know, it just is, is uh, you know, bringing all the resources and the equipment up there. Uh, you know, they they basically pulled a figure out of the air and said sixty billion dollars uh, uh, or something. That's that's they wouldn't scratch the surface of it. And then America is not going to build a railway from Alaska down to Seattle or Chicago or whatever, all the way through uh, Alaska and then Canada to you know to make it uh, uh, useful at all. This is just, uh, you know, a, a, a Putin kind of grand projet that is never going to happen. I, can, like, I stake my life on it, honestly. <laughs> I, have been, I have been dreaming of one day <laughs> taking a train all the way to New York. Railway and what it's symbolised to them. Um, and my question was specifically about that northern branch, the Baikal to Amur one. How much is it used today compared to the traffic along the more southern branch? How many trains approximately go along it? Um, how many passengers, roughly speaking? Um, and what attitude do pe did people in Russia have at the time when it was finally completed? Was there any kind of big hurrah, or was it more of a, oh, that's finally over, thank goodness for that? It three times, actually, because <laughs> they kept on opening it uh, Brezhnev opened it once, Gorbachev opened it once, and finally they opened it again because it was never uh, quite completed. There are, as far as I can establish, some uh, container trains uh, uh, that, that use it, but ma many fewer than uh, the Trans-Siberian itself, which is essentially pretty full. I mean, when you sit in the Trans-Siberian, you are getting these freight, these very big freight trains kind of going in the other direction. Uh, uh, the whole time, and indeed they are uh, talking of building other lines through, uh, establishing other train routes through Kazakhstan and Iran and the like uh, to take some of the load off the Trans-Siberian. The trouble with the, the, the Bambis, there are some 
uh, occasional passenger trains. There's very, still very few people up there, though, and, and Oliver has been on it and said that, that you know, there are passengers who use it. Like with the Trans-Siberian, something that probably I didn't explain probably, the Trans-Siberian is very, very heavily used by people traveling from along bits of it, you know, for a day or two days or whatever. Local people, it is the main way they get around uh, uh, through, uh, uh, through Siberia because there's not many airports, the planes are very expensive, uh, you know, it's the main artery. So the BAM does operate a bit like that, but uh, from what I can gather, and, and I so want to go along it myself actually, uh, and, and didn't, and want to find out more about it, from what I can gather, um, it's still struggling to uh, justify its, its existence. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it's still a single track railway. It, it's, it's never going to be uh, what they had hoped it would be, which was a kind of completely new container route. It's just uh, too slow, uh, too complex, and uh, it joins in with the Trans-Siberian uh, anyway at Taishet, so uh, it then just adds to the more traffic there. So, so Given that the Trans-Siberian is pretty full, it, it, it can't accommodate the, the kind of extra traffic. The gentleman over here. Uh, one, of your, your, one of your recommendations was don't eat in the restaurant club. <laughs> Have you had any other recommendations? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, look, uh, the restaurant car, I, I was being slightly harsh. It varies. That there are different sorts of trains. I deliberately travelled on ordinary service trains from Vladivostok. I went the wrong way round on purpose from Vladivostok to, uh, uh, to Moscow uh, because uh, I, I didn't want to meet any tourists at all and I achieved that, I, I, so it's entirely, entirely on the service trains. That suit, it didn't look very appetizing, but it was actually quite nice, which is the only nice thing they do the, is, the, is the suit. But most people just bring along stocks of pot noodles or, or the variant of pot noodles, they act much better than pot noodles. And they have a they have a, a summer bar at the end of every carriage. Uh, you bring your own tea bags as well, right? Um, and uh, you just spend all day kind of fill up your pot noodles and, and, and eat. That's my best recommendation for eating on the train. Of course, you buy cheese and bread and, 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 and the like. The, the 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 dining cars. We never quite understood what was going on. We had paid for some meals on some of the trains, uh, but we only got one meal a day. And we'd get this waiter who'd come through and say, uh, fish, chicken, pig, <laughs> fish, chicken, pig. And it's like, ah, oh, right, uh, yeah, you know, fish or chicken, and that was the soup, and that was pretty much uh, all you got. So it was rather unfair, well, I'll bring your own food. Uh, and also buy, and on some stations, you, you stop about half an hour, and you, you, uh, you can actually buy food off the local uh, store holders. Uh, the other thing is, bring a Kindle or, or, or Harry Potter or something, because, Okay, look, look, I, I have to have slight explanation uh, of slight trouble with this. I actually loved every minute of it, but I can put up with kind of looking at the, the birch trees for kind of half a day and looking at and just imagining what it was like and my father was Russian and I can think of him and, and all these sort of things. Uh, and I think that is a wonderful experience. And you talk to these Russian people who sit in the same carriage as you and they bring their food and they... They speak in you know, three words of, of English, and you speak three words of Russian, and you have a conversation all day. And I love all that. Now, if you don't love all that, don't necessarily go on the line. But I think it is the greatest experience ever. If you get off of these towns, you, you maybe stay two or three days in these towns in the middle of uh, Siberia, and you realize you are somewhere so different, so far away from anything removed, it gives you time to kind of think and enjoy. But it, it, maybe it's a bit of a required taste, but I would still recommend it, and I will do it again. There's a gentleman in the middle here. Um, thank you very much for such an interesting talk. Um, when and what's been the impact of the building of the Trans-Mongolian coming into the Trans-Siberian from Beijing? Um, well, that, that uh, is equally an important artery, and uh, it is the route that most of the tourists take, which I think is a mistake, actually. I think stay in Russia. Um, because then you get a different experience. You go through Ulan uh, Bator and the like, um, and uh, you actually actually have to change gauge. So so the train gets lifted off, and you get different bogies put on and, and stuff. And that's all very fascinating. There's lots of smuggling on the border. My daughter 
uh, my stepdaughter travelled along it, and uh, uh, you get asked to put on kind of jackets that pretend they're yours, so that you're importing them, and then you get taken off. So there's quite an experience there. And the transfer going, and is you know it takes you through to Beijing, and it's fascinating. Uh, but my my advice is stay in Russia, experience the Russian experience, uh, uh, the Russian kind of culture, understand how completely different this country is. Maybe it will help you understand the madness of what Putin is doing in Ukraine by just being on this railway. Because it, it kind of, it, it, there's a whole Russian ethos, uh, an ethic that is very different from ours. And I think you understand it by, by, being, by being on the Russian railway for, for kind of a week. Basically the experience takes a week if you don't get off any trains. It's seven, six and a half days, and that's the faster one. It's seven and a half, eight days if you take the slightly slower trains. Do that. There's a gentleman, gentleman here. Um, I, I uh, noticed in your book that you dealt rather briefly with uh, a couple of episodes that I guess were really rather important contributions of Russian railways to Russia in the 20th century, both in the early years of the Second World War. And the first was the mass movement of industrial complexes uh, to the east of the Urals in the face of the advancing German armies that you mentioned very briefly in your summing up. And the second one was the movement in the opposite direction of the Siberian divisions that it, were to play a critical role in the upshot of the battle for Moscow. And I wondered if the reason why you spent rather little time on those is because there's actually very little archival material available so there isn't actually a great deal to construct a story around but it's beyond the fact that these were astonishing feats of the Russian railways that materially contributed to the upshot of the war in the East. I'm afraid you, you, you gave my answer. <laughs> that it was precisely, I couldn't find, uh, certainly, uh, you know, I don't, I'm a bit of a cheat, you know, I, I wrote this entirely from British, uh, sort of English language sources, apart from a couple of Russian experts who were helping me. Uh, uh, with some with some questions that I asked them um, uh, to, to, to help me with, but there is very little of that. Uh, there is another book to be written there, or certainly a chunk of a book. I, I could find out very little about those uh, about those episodes. And as I said, they were vitally important. Uh, but uh, you know, I slightly skated over them for that reason. The answer to my question. There's a gentleman here on to your left. Um, are, are all of the station clocks along the line still set to Moscow time? Uh, yes, no, uh, and that is very sensible. At first I thought, you know, why are we taking uh, a train at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon when it's leaving at 10 o'clock at night? Um, and, and, you know, this was very confusing. Uh, but actually, uh, when you start thinking about it, it is much better that they, uh, because there's uh, five or six, there's one place where they change two hours, I think, so they, there's five or six places where you change, uh, 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 where you, you, you lose an hour as you're kind of, uh, 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 sorry, you gain an hour as you're heading kind of uh, um, westwards. And, and uh, uh, you know, we were very grateful for that. By the end of it, we were expert on Moscow time. We kind of knew everywhere where, you know, exactly what we were doing. Um, and th that, that is right. The one thing that has changed, apparently a lot of the early travellers described how uh, all the meals were uh, served by Moscow time. So people were having breakfast at kind of uh, five o'clock in the afternoon, you know. And, uh, and then they did, they did realise that that didn't make enormous sense. So they vaguely kind of equated meals. Although, as I've said earlier, the meals were pretty haphazard process. And, um, uh, you know, we're quite difficult. But so, yes, Moscow time all the way through. And there's a gentleman right in front of you here. Yes. Um, if you, uh, you said briefly that it took about 10 years to make 6,000 miles of railway. Uh, looking ahead, you have HS2 phase one. Uh, what is the, how would you comment on the difference in the, in the rate of construction? Yes, uh, I have made this comment. We're not going to go into AJ2, which, over, over which I have controversial views, which you can ask me in the tent or later if you want. But, uh, um, well, essentially, uh, there, there, you know, there is little kind of rational explanation. We do live in very different times. We live in kind of populated areas. Uh, we have legislative processes which are 
uh, you know, different. The land was all owned by the Russian state. It's essentially Siberia was owned by the Russian state, so they could do what they wanted with it. There were no landowners out there. Um, they could. Uh, uh, they built a very crude railway, a very fairly unsafe railway initially. Um, you know, they plonked down, uh, uh, you know, tracks with no, no, pretty much no signaling equipment. Um, you know, it was all, it was all fairly basic stuff. But you know, even saying all that, you still can't quite understand why it's going to take 20 years to build uh, 300 lines of miles of railway. I mean, at the end of the day, actually, it's an unanswerable question because you know, we surely could be able to do that. My other example, actually, I mean, I wrote a book about uh, the London Underground. The first line of the London Underground between Paddington and Farringdon, essentially, nearly five miles long, digging up a tunnel underneath what is now the Euston Road. They built that in three years, and then they were six months late for a million pounds, you know. So there is some bits that are inexplicable about it. So maybe I'll get my train to America before HS2 opens. Uh, yeah, I think, I think yeah. <laughs> so we are nearing the end, sadly. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, I think you've indicated your preference for Moscow to Vladivostok or Vladivostok to Moscow? No, Vladivostok to Moscow, I did, yeah. And, and the reason for oh, that? The, the, the reason, there were several reasons, actually. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, <coughs> You know, you, if, you, if you do Moscow to Vladivostok, you then have, if you fly back, you then have a 14-hour flight back to London or whatever. Whereas the way we did it, we, we, arrived, we did a 10-hour flight, a 10-hour, it must be the longest internal flight in the world, a 10-hour flight from Moscow to Vladivostok, right? Uh, and then we were completely zonked when we got there, of course. And, but then we were able to sit on the train and kind of, you know, doze quite. Maybe that's why I kind of managed to not get bored because I slept kind of quite a lot of the first day. But um, uh, so I really recommend doing that way. There's far fewer tourists doing that way, so you don't, you know, don't, don't get encumbered with lots of uh, American tourists. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, and, uh, other national, yeah. And uh, uh, you know, so you're you're basically uh, uh, you know alone with the Russians. Uh, on service trains. I would recommend not taking the tourist train. The service train only cost me 300 quid all the way, actually, because I used, and that was a, there's three classes. There's a, a two-bed class, first class. There's a four-bed class, which is the one I use, second class. And there's a third class, which is for people who are younger than most of this audience, maybe Oliver, which is 50 people in a carriage, which is sort of a little bit much. Um, but I would recommend Vladivostok to Moscow in the four, in the second class, um, with the occasional pig fish soup meal. <laughs> signing copies of this book in the bookshop afterwards, I highly recommend it, and if you are going on the train, don't forget it, don't possibly take it on your e-book, um, since you're going to need quite a lot of other books to keep you going for eight days. Thank you very much, Chris Williams.